Good evening, Six Packers. Welcome back to Sharing the Catholic Faith. Tonight, we're going to be looking at infect, uh, indefectibility, infallibility, heresy, schism, and apostasy. Uh, I'm Joe Sixpack, the Every Catholic Guy for new people. I'm a consecrated Marian catechist, uh, and a columnist for The Wander. I have the Cantankerous Catholic Podcast, etc. <laughs> um, and uh, tonight, as we go along, this is our last presentation on the ninth article of the creed as we go along tonight you're subject to have questions and if you do please when you have the question go ahead and type it in the chat box uh i won't see it or uh answer questions until we get to question time at the end but if in my experience if you uh fail to ask your question when you have it, you're going to forget by the time we get to the question period, and then you won't get your question answered, and that's a shame. Uh, but you also might have questions that you don't want to ask on the webinar, even though I protect people's identity, uh, or you might have questions that occur to you later in the week, in which case you need to go ahead and go to uh, the Ask Joe page, at joesixpackanswers.com and ask any question you want. I'm happy to do it. Uh, I get several questions every week, um, and I'm I'm happy to reply. I try to get to them within 48 hours. Usually, I can get to them within a couple of hours. Uh, before we move forward with our opening prayer, I want to mention something. The election's over. Well, no, it's not really over. <laughs> uh, regardless of what the media, including Fox, Joe Biden, and the Democratic Party say, he is not president-elect Joe Biden yet uh, because no decision has been made. The Supreme Court's involved. There's still a lot of things going on. But it brings home a point that I wanted to make. I've told you for weeks that we're in a lot of trouble, not just in America, but in the church, around the world. Things are the worst they've ever been globally and in the church. So now more than ever, people need to know, understand, and learn how to live their faith. You can't live what you don't know. And so you need to try to get as many of your family and friends here as possible. I don't care what they say about, you know, they, they're, most of them are probably going to say, well, I already know the faith. No, they don't. No, they don't. I, <laughs> I can count on one hand the number of lay people I've met in the last six years that I've lived here who can even tell you how many sacraments there are, much less name them. People don't know the faith regardless of what they think. They say, well, I've been a Catholic all my life, or I went to eight years of Catholic school. So what? Big deal. You still haven't been taught the faith. It's not your fault that you don't know the faith. What is your fault is if you choose to continue to remain in catechetical ignorance. And that's what you should tell your family and friends. See, I love you people who attend these webinars. Uh, well, I try to love everybody, but I, you're kind of special to me because you want to learn and understand the faith better. And I've got folks who've been attending these webinars consistently for th uh, three or four years, however long I've been doing them. And... That is a really good thing because they understand that repetition is uh, the best teacher. So let's go ahead and get started. I want to begin with an opening word of prayer, all right? Here we go. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Third person of the Blessed Trinity, soul of our souls, we ask that you open our hearts and minds to know what is truth, help us to imbibe those truths, and then to live by them. Grant this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, 
and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so we're going to begin by talking about uh, indefectibility and infallibility. What does indefectibility mean? Well, indefectibility means that the Catholic Church will remain until the end of time, that it can't be destroyed by any force in the world or from hell. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, And I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not, uh, shall not prevail against it. Since Christ promised that not even the gates of hell shall prevail against his church, we have the steadfast assurance that the church will continue until the end of the world. Now look, that doesn't mean that the gates of hell or the forces of hell won't try to destroy the church. That they, <laughs> The forces of hell have been trying to destroy the church since the resurrection, since the day of Pentecost. Uh, but it hasn't happened. We have Jesus guarantee that it won't happen. So, you know, don't ever sell the church short or give up on the church. Uh, what does infallibility mean? Well, infallibility, excuse me, I have rented lips tonight. <laughs> infallibility means that the impossibility of falling into error, the, pers the perpetual assistance of Christ and the Holy Spirit guarantees the purity and integrity of the faith and morals taught by the church. Would a good God who uh, desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth fail to provide his, res uh, provide his revelation with a living and fallible teacher? Would a just God command us to believe under penalty of, uh, sin, penalty of hell and at the same time leave us to the mercy of every false and lying teacher preaching gospel opposed to his own? Well, no, the church that Christ founded is everywhere spoken of in the New Testament as a divine teaching, uh, infallible teaching authority. Because Jesus and his church are one, and because he's an infallible God, because he's perfect, God, uh, his church, must by necessity be infallible. Okay, it cannot not be infallible. Is the Pope infallible? And this comes at a good time. Uh, this whole subject of papal infallibility tonight. According to Lumen Gentium uh, of the Second Vatican Council, the Roman pontiff, head of the College of Bishops, enjoys this infallibility in virtue of his office when, as supreme pastor and teacher of all the faithful, who confirms his brethren in the faith, he proclaims by a definitive act a doctrine pertaining to faith or morals. Now, this doesn't mean the Pope's infallible in all things, as we <laughs> we certainly have seen recently. Uh, for example, the Pope wouldn't be exercising the charism of infallibility if he were to pr uh, predict the winner of the World Series. Carl Keating says that the uh, uh, inability of the church to teach error is infallibility, and it's a negative protection, a negative protection. It means what's efficiently taught will not be wrong, not that the official teachers are going to have the wits about them to stand up and teach what's right when it needs to be taught. The Pope is only inf uh, infallible under the four following conditions. First, when he speaks ex cathedra, that is, when he speaks officially as supreme pastor of the universal church. He's not infallible when acting as supreme lawmaker, judge, or ruler over the church, nor is he infallible as a simple priest or the local bishop of Rome. Two, when he defines a doctrine regarding faith and morals. This means to settle a doctrine definitely, finally, and irrevocably. To omit defining a doctrine may cause great harm uh, or be negligence on the part of the Pope, but that wouldn't nullify the charism of infallibility. Of course, we saw, well, no, I'll, I'll wait until we get to the fourth one before I say that. Uh, three, when he speaks of faith and morals, which includes the whole content of divine revelation, it follows that the Pope is also infallible in judging doctrines and facts 
so intimately connected with revelation that they can't be denied without endangering revelation itself. And finally, when he intends to bind the entire church and the intention of binding all the faithful must be clearly stated. If he fails to express the intention of binding the consciences of the faithful, it's not an infallible pronouncement. You, Many of you may recall whenever John Paul was still Pope, uh, he issued a document pertaining to the ordination of women. And he was very, very, very strong in that. But he stopped just short of making it uh, an infallible pronouncement binding the consciences of all Catholics. So it, you know, he was teaching infallibly, but he wasn't uh, teaching such a thing that it just absolutely had to be accepted by all Catholics. It does have to be accepted in order to be, uh, in order for you to be uh, an Orthodox Catholic. But he stopped just short of making it an, an infallible pronouncement the way uh, who I think it was Pius the Ninth did regarding the Immaculate Conception, or Pius the Twelfth did regarding uh, uh, the Assumption. So, you know, it requires some very strong language. Okay. Uh, are the bishops infallible? Well, individually, the bishops aren't infallible. However, they do teach infallibly in an ecumenical council such as Vatican Council II here, uh, when, with the approval of the Pope, they set forth teachings of faith or morals to be held by the entire church. Uh, the bishops can also teach infallibly when, in union with the Pope again, Outside of an ecumenical council, they all teach the same doctrine of faith and morals. In other words, they're teaching infallibly um, whenever they teach the 2,000-year constant teaching of the church. And they're teaching infallibly in a council whenever they uh, uh, teach on doctrine of faith and morals. Now, of course, you need to understand Vatican II, which was a valid and beautiful counsel. If you haven't read the documents, you should. I've read them all, uh, and I frequently refer to them. It's a beautiful, beautiful counsel. But it was a pastoral counsel, not a dogmatic counsel like Trent or uh, Vatican I even. Vatican I never got to finish because of the Italian Revolution, and more or less, Vatican II finished Vatican I. Um, but other councils in the past were, um, or most of the other councils in the past were dogmatic councils. Vatican II was a uh, pastoral council. Does infallibility mean the Pope can do no wrong? <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, in fact, that would be called impeccability, and no Catholic claims that. Infallibility doesn't mean that the Pope can't commit sin. He may commit sin just like any other Catholic, and he's bound to seek forgiveness like any other Catholic through the sacrament of penance. Uh, infallibility is not a personal charism, but rather a divine and official charism given by Christ to Peter and his successors to keep them from error in defining the content of the deposit of faith. Why did Jesus make his church infallible? And that is so important, especially when talking to Catholics who don't understand the faith, when talking to Catholic or when talking to non-Catholics, this is an incredibly important feature that people it can be it can be uh, proven right in sacred scripture, but most people pass over it. Um uh, Jesus made the church infallible so that she wouldn't compromise with the ideas of changing times nor yield to pressures within or without the church, but would always teach only the faith and uh, entrusted to her by, by her divine founder, of course, which is Jesus Christ. Almost without exception, other Christian religions have changed their theological views particularly as regards morals. 
For instance, 50 or 60 years ago, something, some fundamentalist sects uh, didn't teach that the use of tobacco was wrong. Uh, today, however, they teach that the use of tobacco, even in moderation, is sinful. Does that mean that a modern fundamentalist grandfather who smoked went to heaven, but the modern fundamentalist will go to hell if he smokes? That seems to be the implication. Uh, the Catholic Church, on the other hand, is always taught that using tobacco products in moderation is normally not sinful. But there's a much more vivid example of uh, in events that have taken place in Christendom since uh, 1930. At one time, all Christian religions, every one of them on the face of planet Earth, taught that artificial contraception is a sin worthy of eternal punishment. But in England, at the Lambeth Conference in 1930, the bishops of the Anglican Church were under immense pressure due to the sexual revolution uh, which was raging over there at that time, to rule that artificial birth control was acceptable. I've read the document they produced. If it weren't so tragic, it would be hilarious. It was laughable because their logic, well, there was no logic, none whatsoever. Although those Protestant bishops admitted artificial contraception is worthy of eternal damnation, they granted permission for its use by, by their Anglican or to their Anglican followers. Uh, today, the Catholic Church stands virtually all alone in condemning the use of artificial contraception. And in future presentations, we're going to talk about that pretty extensively because unfortunately, uh, upwards of 90% of married Catholics use artificial contraception. They're not only killing their own children because all chemical contraceptives are abortifacient, but they're also risking eternal damnation for themselves. Uh, Jesus made his church infallible to protect the fullness of divinely revealed truth because Jesus, who is God, according to Hebrews 13, 8, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So therefore, his moral laws and doctrines of faith must also remain the same. He doesn't change things because he can't change. He's perfect. Perfection cannot change. If it changes, it was never perfect in the first place. How should Catholics feel toward the church? Well, look, Jesus called for unconditional obedience to the church as noted in these passages. Uh, because of this, and the fact that Jesus and his church are one, Catholics should allow themselves to be guided by the church, assent to her teachings, love her, respect her priests and bishops, and pledge their fidelity to the Supreme Pontiff who represents Jesus on earth. Now, I just want to mention something about that. Again, we've already talked about when a pope is infallible. This pope, it has recently come out, endorsed uh, legalizing same-sex unions all over the world. That's heresy. And frankly, he's a heretic. Uh, however, he still has the ability uh, with the charism of infallibility, and we have to learn to discern when he's um, uh, being infallible and when he's just being the Bishop of Rome or a private individual, even. Okay. That is the reason for this lesson. So whenever you get, I, I would highly recommend when you get the link to the recording of this lesson, you go back and watch it probably two or three more times, to be honest. Okay. So that you can really get it in your head whenever the Pope is infallible, and of course, if it doesn't meet any of the conditions, and it has, has to meet all those conditions, uh, then you know if, if, it, if what he says doesn't meet those conditions that he's not being infallible. And you can tell, you, I'm sure, 
all of you have talked to Catholics in recent weeks who are really confused about what the Pope said and scandalized by what the Pope said. And you certainly have a right to be scandalized. You shouldn't be confused if you know and understand the ninth article of the creed. Uh, but you've talked to these people. You can help them better understand by better understanding yourself when the Pope's infallible. What is heresy? Okay, here we're going to talk about three different terms. And then whenever I've explained those terms, I'm going to give examples to demonstrate so that you can uh, uh, better understand which is which. So heresy is the deliberate denial of one or more truths of the Catholic faith. If someone intentionally holds to what that person knows is heresy, that person risks eternal damnation. What is schism? <laughs> some, some people like to say schism. I'm all right with that. I don't think that's proper pronunciation, but what the heck. Schism is the deliberate refusal of a Catholic to submit to the authority of the Pope. This, is all, this also presents a risk of eternal damnation. What is apostasy? Well, apostasy is the complete rejection of one's Catholic faith. Like heresy and schism, the apostate risks eternity in hell. Now, what's the difference between these? Let's give it with practical examples. Let's say a Catholic decides he's going to become a Baptist or a Methodist or a Pentecostal. That Catholic then becomes a heretic because we, in, in all of the Protestant religions, we hold a lot of truths in common, us and them. So it's not a complete rejection of the Catholic faith. It's merely a rejection of parts of the Catholic faith. And that makes them a heretic. Now, schismatic, someone who's guilty of schism, um, that would be someone who joins the, uh, 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 well, the priestly, no, what's it called? The uh, uh, priestly fraternity of St. Pius X, I think is the name of it. Uh, SSPX, and maybe it's the Society of St. Pius X, uh, some, and even someone who participates in one of their masses is committing a, an act of schism. Now, all right, before anybody goes to raising questions here, no, the Pope did not normalize them. The Pope merely lifted the excommunication against their priests and bishops but they're still schismatic. They still uh, are in schism because they refuse to accept the authority of the Pope. And so, you know, you can't go to their masses. In fact, you you uh, if you go on a Sunday thinking that's okay, it's not. You, you do not fulfill your Sunday obligation. Um, you know, avoid them like the plague. Now, apostasy, a practical example of that. Let's say that a Catholic decided to become a Buddhist. Well, that would make that person an apostate. Why? Because he's rejecting the entire Catholic faith, all of it. He doesn't even accept any parts of it that Protestantism accepts. So that person becomes an apostate. Now, since Jesus Christ founded the Catholic Church to continue his mission of salvation, are all people obliged to belong to it? I, listen, you will talk, I, out of every hundred people you talk to, I'll bet you all but two of them, maybe just one of them, is going to say, no, you don't have to, you're not obligated to belong to the Catholic Church, and that's wrong. That's dead wrong. The fathers of Vatican II explained it this way. Basing itself on scripture and tradition, the council teaches that the church, a pilgrim now on earth, is necessary for salvation. The one Christ is the mediator and the way of salvation. He is present to us in his body, which is the church. He himself explicitly asserted the necessity of faith and baptism, 
and thereby affirmed at the same time the necessity of the church, which men enter through baptism is through a door. Hence, they could not, listen, this is the most important part of this. Hence, they could not be saved who, knowing that the Catholic Church was founded as necessary by God through Christ, would refuse either to enter it or to remain in it. Now, we'll come back on that in a second. But however, the same council fathers went on to say, uh, those who through no fault of their own don't, do not know the gospel of Christ or his church, but who nevertheless seek God with, an, with a sincere heart and, moved by grace, try in their own actions to do his will as they know it through the dictate of their conscience, those too may achieve eternal salvation. A lot of Catholics have left the church, most of them just giving up on Christianity altogether, just giving up on religion. Many of them went over to Protestant churches or New Age garbage, anything. But regardless of what they've done, they've rejected the Catholic Church. Through this lesson, it's another reason why you should go through it several times. In fact, go through the recording of this lesson and the previous two. Good reason for it is because you can better understand to explain to your Catholic relatives and friends what kind of danger they're in. Every single time I make this presentation, I get angry responses throughout the week from people who uh, watch the recording or people who attended the webinar. They're angry with me because I've said, they got, the Catholics got to be a Catholic. I mean, that's all there is to it. People are obliged to belong to the Catholic Church. Why do they get angry with me about that? Well, it's almost always 100, I would say 100% of the time. It's because they have relatives. They have family who have left the church and they don't want to hear that that family is in danger of hell. But I'm sorry. If you don't like that, take it up with Jesus. He's the one that said it, not me. Okay? So that's just the way it is. Okay? What is the difference between the Catholic Church and all other Christian churches? Well, Catholics are members of the other, uh, I'm sorry, Catholics and the members of other Christian churches are brothers who believe in Jesus Christ. They're baptized and possess in common many means of grace and elements of truth. However, our separated brethren are not yet blessed with that unity that Jesus bestowed on his followers. May a Catholic belong to a secret society? Well, Catholics are discouraged from seeking membership in secret societies, but not, uh, uh, not banned from doing that. However, uh, the church does forbid membership to any secret society that any way plots against the church or state. As you've learned a couple of weeks ago, uh, I was a Mason before I became a Catholic, a fourth generation Mason to be exact. And the reason that the church, I, I unfortunately, I've known a lot of Catholics who are Masons. Uh, and it's, I think this is conspiracy theorists doing this, but some people have even said that Francis is a Mason. Well, whether he is or not, that's irrelevant because the stated mission or part of the stated mission of Freemasonry is, quote, the violent overthrow of church and state. Now, the violent overthrow of state hasn't so much been an issue here in the United States because... <laughs> With the exception of John Carroll of Carrollton, who uh, signed the Declaration of Independence, and I think two different people on the Constitution, everybody who signed the Declaration and the Constitution uh, were uh, Masons. <laughs> so our country was actually founded by Masons, mostly. Uh, so that hasn't been so much of an issue for the United States. However, uh, 
we have always been the victim of uh, of some pretty extreme uh, anti-Catholic measures by the Masons. In fact, you may remember the Know Nothing movement, which of course was before any of us were born, but still existed uh, clear up until, well, I think Al Smith was the last person to run for president, Catholic uh, who ran for president whenever the Know Nothing movement was still around. The, the Know Nothings were Masons, or at least most of them were. It was started by Masons. So you have to avoid Masonry, and please tell your family and friends to get out if they're in it. Um, what does the Catholic Church claim from the state? Well, obviously, what the church claims is religious freedom. If Joe Biden becomes president, heaven forbid, you won't have any religious freedom anymore. He is absolutely insistent on shutting down religious freedom. I don't get that. He wants to try to promote himself as a great Catholic, which he isn't. But he and the entire Democratic Party want to take away our religious liberties. But the church insists that we get that. Now, uh, should the state fear the church? Well, no, the state shouldn't fear the church. Good grief. According to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it is the duty of citizens to work with civil authority for building up society in the spirit of truth, justice, solidarity, and freedom. However, citizens are obliged in conscience not to follow the directive of civil authorities if they are contrary to the demands of the moral order, which is why I say that you don't need any more than this, although I can cite lots and lots of stuff, official church documents, the Bible, things that the church fathers have said. Uh, that's why every single bishop in this country who curtailed the mass during the pandemic lockdowns was absolutely 100% morally wrong. He was wrong. We needed more masses during the lockdown, not fewer. I mean, after all, if you, uh, uh, if you curtail the masses, then you're automatically sending a message to the people. We don't believe in the power of the mass and the mass is enormously powerful. In fact, it's infinitely powerful. So bishops who did that were terribly, terribly wrong. I'd like to give them the benefit of the doubt and say they were misguided. Unfortunately, that's not true. I want you to understand, we do have some tremendously dynamic, courageous, and great bishops, such as Bishop Strickland of Tyler, Texas. Uh, he's probably the most outspoken in this country, but there are others like him. Um, but we also have, well, we have some bishops who are cowardly. They're orthodox, but they're afraid to speak up. And, of course, uh, there's a passage in Revelation talking about that, and it doesn't bode very well for them on Judgment Day. And then, of course, we have some bishops who are just flat-out Marxists that I'm not saying that because I don't like them. I'm saying that because they have proven it themselves. They're faithless and they're Marxist. And that's sad. I've had more than my share of feuds with a few of them too. <laughs> that's all right. I, I don't mind that. <laughs> uh, what, what do we mean when we say, I believe in the communion of saints? Here's where people begin to get uh, things a bit confused about the church. Most Catholics think the Catholic church, all it is, is what is headquartered in the Vatican, at the Vatican, and everything falling under the Vatican's authority. No, it is not, okay? The communion of saints is the spiritual union which unites the church militant, which is the church on earth, the church suffering, which are the souls in purgatory, 
and the church victorious, which is the church in heaven. We're all united into one mystical body. Uh, the saints, by their spiritual close, closeness to God, obtained from him many graces and favors for those in the church militant, which is us, those on earth, and the souls in purgatory. The, uh, the faithful on earth, by their prayers and good works, honor and love the saints and give relief to the suffering souls by their prayers in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And incidentally, November is has always been, or I, I can't say always, but for centuries, has been dedicated uh, to the church trying to empty purgatory uh, during the month of November through prayers and masses offered and penances. And I want to tell you something. If you've got deceased loved ones and you made the mistake of thinking, oh, they're in a better place, no, they're not. If they were saved, which is highly unlikely because very few people are saved, that's something to keep in mind. Depends on how seriously you take your faith and try to live it. Uh, if they if they were saved, they probably went to purgatory. And many, many, many of our friends and family are languishing in purgatory, suffering, because we don't pray for them anymore. We just don't pray for them. And I'm going to talk a lot more about that next week. Finally, the suffering souls in purgatory also pray for those who are still on earth. And I, I personally think I've been the beneficiary of uh, friends in purgatory. I really do. I think they've really helped me out at times. Okay, believe it or not, <laughs> it's question time. Do any of you have any questions at all? I don't like it when I don't get questions because that tells me either uh, you think I've covered everything perfectly, and I want to tell you, I <laughs> the man who taught me is the real Catholic teacher, not, not me. I'm not very good at this stuff, or I'm not as good as people like to think. Or you're telling me you're not really paying attention. I don't believe that or you wouldn't bother uh, showing up here, okay? Okay, what is ex cathedra again? Ex cathedra, cathedra means the chair. So ex cathedra means from the chair or in this case, from the chair of Peter. When the Pope uh, speaks officially as the supreme pastor of the church, in other words, they say, when he speaks from the chair of Peter, of course, it's not a literal chair. Um, it's like whenever you go talk to a judge in chambers, you're still at the bench if it's an official uh, meeting, okay? Even though the bench isn't in there, it's out in the courtroom. The same thing here with ex cathedra. It means uh, from the chair or from the chair of Peter. And um, it's whenever the Pope speaks um, as the official supreme pastor of the church and speaks in an official way, uh, something binding the consciences of all Catholics. Do we have any other questions? By the way, thank you for the question. I appreciate that. Actually, this person asks a question almost every week, and I appreciate that. I like that a lot. Uh, I love questions. That's what it's all about. Do we have any other questions tonight? I'm going to give it about 10 more seconds and then we're going to go on because these questions are every bit as important as uh, the actual presentation because sometimes I may move quickly over something and you don't get a chance to catch it, which is probably why this question got asked. Uh, and you know, I may make a mistake there, or I may say something wrongly and somebody will catch me on the side. This is, this is so important. It's every bit as important as the uh, presentation itself. Okay, there are no more questions. I certainly went more than 10 seconds. So I want to invite you this, uh, you know, last week on the Cantankerous Catholic, we had um, Father Robert Altier as a guest. And I mentioned in that 
podcast that in that episode that we had, uh, uh, it was time for us to get back to building Christ's army. And, uh, oh, let me, let me go ahead and get this question. Uh, how to bring family back to the Catholic faith. I know by my own actions, but, well, look, all of our lives, we have been taught very wrongly that you shouldn't talk about controversial topics. And, of course, usually people are thinking about uh, religion and politics. Well, I don't believe in talking about controversial topics either, so I never bring up, I never discuss organized sports or soap operas. Uh, however, issues pertaining to religion and politics always deal with elements of truth. And truth can never be controversial. All right, is two plus two controversial? Two plus two equals four? Is gravity controversial? Well, there are actually some flaky people out there who belong to the Flat Earth Society, and it might be controversial to them because they might refuse to believe in gravity. But gravity in itself is not controversial. Uh, the same way with 2 plus 2 equals 4. Truth cannot be controversial. However, truth will often cause emotional upset for people. You know, like a while ago, I talked about people who every single time I give this presentation, there are people who get angry with me because I said, you've got to be a Catholic. Uh, in other words, there's no, uh, no salvation outside the Catholic Church, with the exception of what the Council Father said. People get angry about that. Why do they get angry? It's true. Why would you get angry about that? Well, because you don't want to accept it. But And because there's a conflict between your knowledge that it's true and the fact that you don't want to accept it, there is, um, there is an emotional response. My point is, you've got to constantly, constantly, and it doesn't matter if they say, hey, I'm not going around this crazy relative of mine anymore, because every time I go, he or she brings up the faith. I don't want to hear about that. Well, that's too bad. You know, two of the core of uh, spiritual works of mercy are to instruct the ignorant and to uh, admonish the sinner. And the very thing we're talking about has to do with those two. And you know what? There's seven corporal works of mercy and seven spiritual works of mercy. And every single Catholic, is obliged to do all 14 of those. There's not any that you're not obligated to do. So therefore, you have to put on your big boy pants and make up your mind that no matter how afraid you are, you're going to talk to your relatives about this. Now, I admit, use prudence as to when to bring it up, you know, kind of set the conversation up. Don't just dive right into it. There's no sense in turning people off intentionally because that's what would happen. However, you do need to talk to them about the faith. Don't be afraid to. And if they say, hey, you know, I never want to talk to you again. Okay. Okay. That's that's fine. That's exactly how, how what my attitude is about it because I know that they're not going to be there whenever it's time for my judgment they're not going to tell Jesus, oh, look, you know, uh, he didn't want to hurt my feelings. She didn't want to hurt my feelings. So you really shouldn't be be uh, harsh on him or her about uh, uh, about not, not admonishing me or uh, instructing me. No, that's not going to work because at your judgment, there's only you and God. That's it, you and Jesus. That's all there is. And I know which one, which way I'd rather go on it. Okay. I have, for, I have been forsaken by family and friends. You know, the very last words I ever heard my father say to me was whenever I told him on the phone that I was going to become a Catholic. He said, no son of mine is a Roman Catholic. And he never spoke to me again. He died 
without us ever being able to speak again. Uh, did it hurt? Sure it did. Did I let it change my mind? No, I didn't. My father doesn't mean nearly as much to me. No other human person means nearly as much to me as my own salvation. So that's the bottom line of it. Did I answer your question? Did I? I hope so. Um, uh, thank you. I'm so sorry for you about your father. Uh, yes, so true. They don't want to hear the truth. They want the happy feeling churches out there that tell you what they want you to hear. Yeah, you're absolutely 100% correct. And one thing I keep explaining to people, in fact, if you listened to the podcast last week with Father Altier, uh, we talked about this. Jesus was not nice. He was not nice. He loved everybody, but he wasn't nice. He publicly called men hypocrites and liars and white painted sepulchers full of dead men's bone. He drove people from the temple with a whip. None of that sounds very nice to me, okay? But that was the absolute perfect charity. Why? Because he did and said what people needed. And that was truth. So if they don't accept that, that's their problem, not yours. And, you know, you don't have to be successful about bringing people into the church or back into the church. God doesn't ask you to be successful. It's not possible for you to be successful anyway, because that's above your pay grade. That is, uh, that's God's responsibility. Admittedly, uh, he has used me to bring hundreds of people into the church over the last 32 years. But you wouldn't believe it for the first couple of years I was doing it. I didn't make a single convert. Why? Well, for one thing, it wasn't time. Uh, apparently, he wanted me to learn a lot more, and he wanted to maybe, I guess, see how sincere I was. But it didn't matter whether I ever made a convert or not. Didn't matter. What matters is that I was willing to do it, that I went out there and did what God wants. Okay. That is, uh, that's the ultimate thing. God never asked you to be successful. He only asked you to perform. That's it. Okay. Uh, I talked about last week in the cantankerous Catholic that we're at a time whenever we really need to build Christ's army up. And in this week's episode, I'll be, which comes out Wednesday, I'll be talking about how to do that, how to become a real warrior of Christ. What the very most basic things you have to begin to do. But then next week, the week, uh, you know, a week from Wednesday, the episode that I do is going to feature an interview with Bishop Joseph Strickland of Tyler, Texas. And I sure hope you folks listen to that because Bishop Strickland, no doubt, is the most, uh, uh, he's the most vocal defender of the faith in America. Uh, I think worldwide that title belongs in the English speaking world to Cardinal Burke. And I'm hoping to have him on soon. Uh, but, uh, in America alone, it's Bishop Strickland. There are other great bishops like Bishop Paprocki of Springfield, Illinois, uh, Bishop to I can't remember his first name, but Bishop Tobin in Rhode Island, not that idiot in New Jersey. I'm sorry, not that Bishop in New Jersey. Uh, you know, we've got several really, really, really good bishops, but the most outspoken in America is Bishop Strickland. And I hope you show up for that. I really do. I hope you listen to it. Uh, next week, we will discuss the unforgivable sin. Everybody talks about the unforgivable sin. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's, well, you'll see. I think you'll be surprised next week. We're going to talk about the different degrees of sin. We're going to talk about our 
resurrection. We're going to talk about the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. We're going to ha look at proofs for the existence of purgatory and a whole lot more. And next week's going to be a really good lesson. I just went over it again tonight, and I oh, I, I love that lesson because purgatory is so logical, and it's in Scripture. So, okay. Uh, if there aren't any more questions, oh, and by the way, you said I'm sorry for for you about your father. Well, I forgot to thank you for uh, uh, expressing that sympathy. Uh, however, dad died in 1989. So, you know, it's been long enough that the hurt's gone. But, uh, and one of these days, maybe I'll, uh, maybe even next week, whenever we talk uh, about uh, purgatory, I'll tell you about my father's death and why I believe either our lady or his guardian angel were present when he died. Uh, and maybe he got to have perfect contrition and got to go to heaven anyway. But okay, let's have ourselves a closing word of prayer. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Now let us offer together the prayer our Lord Jesus Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, folks, I have really, I in, in case you hadn't noticed, I got kind of fired up in tonight's lesson. I, I love talking about the ninth article of the creed. I'm going to really enjoy talking about purgatory next week. Uh, I call that the unforgotten church. And it really, or I'm sorry, the forgotten church. And it really is. Most people forget all about purgatory today. And so I'm anxious to talk about that. Uh, but don't forget, if you have any questions, uh, any questions at all during the week, you be sure and go to the Ask Joe page at joesixpackanswers.com or go to my podcast page, cantankerouscatholic.com, and there is a page there for you to be able to ask me questions. I'm happy to entertain any question you have. Okay, folks, I've enjoyed it. Y'all have yourselves a good evening, and I'll see you next week. Okay? Bye-bye.